Heavenly Father, we thank you for the soon return of our living Lord and of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you tonight for opening your word and making it a living reality to our people in your wonderful Son's name. Amen. I'd like for you to take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians. I thought it'd be wonderful on this Sunday night if I perhaps shared my heart with you along the line of the subject of walking with him. Even before the first year of our ministry in the church in 1941, I had begun to see that most Christians lived a life of failure. They lived far below the par that the word seemed to indicate. So I began asking myself in that first year when we were in the ministry, if Christianity was really true. Really, <laughs> is Christianity really the truth? Then I began to ask if Christianity is really the truth, which brand? These are all questions that ran through my heart and mind. And if Christianity is not true, is one of the other 11 major religions of the world true? Or is Christianity just another one of the religions as an opiate of the people. You see, of the 12 major re religions in the world, according to numbers, Christianity is supposed to be first. Islam or Mohammedanism is second. Hinduism is third. Confucianism is fourth. Buddhism is fifth, Shintoism is sixth, Taoism is seventh, Judaism is eighth, Jainism is ninth, Sikhism is tenth, Zoroastrianism is eleventh, and Baha'i is twelfth. Even before I began in the ministry in 1941, I was very sincere about the things of God, and I worked hard, read a lot, and I endeavored to believe for God's working among the people with the greatest of my ability. In many respects, you would have called me very zealous for God and for the denomination of which I was a part. But as we lived in the ministry that first year, I saw no real maturity or growth among the people. The elders, the deacons, the so-called Christians in the church. And so many times it's appeared to me as being so inconsequential and so useless. And gradually, God led me into seeing that the born-again ones, the Christians, those who believe God raised him from the dead, God's very own children lack three basic things. Number one, they lacked an accurate knowledge of God's word. Consequently, there was failure in their having, number two, an accurate knowledge of their relationship and standing with God. Consequently, they had failure in having an accurate knowledge of their fellowship with God. 
Then one day in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I was reading, and I read verse 2, that it says, Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, and in my mind, flipped Payne, Ohio. That's where I was. Under the Church of God in Payne, Ohio. As I told you before, it's spelled P-A-Y-N-E. To them, or to those who are sanctified. And I looked up the word sanctified that day, and I discovered, which I had thought I knew, which I did know, but it set itself like a great diamond in my soul again, that to be sanctified means to be set apart. You're no longer a part of the unbelieving herd. You are belong to the church of God at Payne, Ohio. You're sanctified. You're set apart. And you were set apart not in the board of elders or deacons or the denomination. You were set apart, sanctified in Christ Jesus. And then it said, called. And I thought, my God, called. Everybody acts like all their earballs are plugged up. Nobody's hearing anything. Called. Called. Called what? Then it said the word saints. And of course, <laughs> I'd been taught that the saints were those who had been dead four or five hundred years and the Roman Catholics deified or something. That's what was a saint. It's what I learned in the theological seminaries that I attended. But here's another word I looked up and I noticed it meant holy ones the ones whom God had made holy. They were sanctified in Christ Jesus and they were called the holy ones, saints. Then it said, with all who in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ, call upon the name, call upon the name, that name which is above all names, to call upon the name. And of course, it, the years that went by in our research, we finally discovered the greatness of the truth of the calling upon that name. Calling upon the name of Jesus, the humiliated one. Christ, the messianic one. Then it added the word our Lord, both theirs and ours. In other words, both past tense and present. So this would apply to my wonderful little bunch over there in Payne, Ohio. And when I got to that word Lord, the Lord stood out in capital letters like this. You'd have to be blinder than a doorbell or something not to see it. I read that in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Lord. And there was the word Lord. At the time, I did not know nearly as much about Revelation and a lot of other stuff as God has allowed me to live and learn in all my years. But when he drew that out, I kept reading. I got to verse 3, and it says, Grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father, and from, there's the word again, Lord, and it stood out again, real big, our Lord Jesus Christ. And I noticed in verse 2 it was Jesus Christ our Lord, then it changed in verse 3 to the Lord the Lord came before the words Jesus Christ, and this arrested my attention. Then I kept reading, and I got down to verse 7, so that 
ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming, the return of our, what? Lord, there it is again, Jesus Christ. And again, that word Lord hit me. That's the third usage already. Then I read in verse 8, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the day of our Lord. That's the fourth time it's used. Every time I read along, that word Lord stood out there in big, big, big letters. Then I kept reading in verse 9. God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Open with Jesus Christ the Lord, and here in verse 9, it ends this verse with Jesus Christ, our what? But it used one word in there, fellowship. And then verse 10. Now I beseech you, I beggingly implore you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's its sixth usage. The number six is always the number for man in the Bible. And that is its last usage here, six times in the first ten verses. And then I noticed as I read on in verse 10 that this Lord, Jesus Christ, required of us or beseeched us, implored us regarding four things. Number one, that ye all speak what? The same thing. Speak the same thing. Number two, that there be no what? Division among you. If we do not speak the same thing, there will be division among those who have made him Lord. To make him Lord is to make him party of the first part of your life. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, Romans, if thou wilt confess with thy mouth, what? Right. Jesus says what? Lord. He's got to be the Lord. And when the first time you heard yourself speak in tongues, the word says, that's the proof to you that you have made him Lord. And those of us who have made him Lord, there are four things in here, people. Four wonderful points for the walk of the man number six in the world. Four is the world number. Man lives in the world. We are in the world, but not of it, for we belong to him. So a man's walk, the number six, a man's walk in the world has four points in here. Speak the same, so there be, number two, no division among you, but that you be perfectly joined together, joined, united, same renewed mind. And in the same judgment, same renewed mind is point number three. So thereby will be number four, same accord. The word is judgment here. But when you work this, it means judgment of one accord. It means unity of the same opinion, of the same esteem. It is the noun form 
of the word genoma, of which the verb form is hegekomai, meaning to lead out unto. When he is the Lord and we're honest about it, renewing our minds, he will lead us out unto the unity, unto the opinion, unto the esteem of the oneness in Christ Jesus, people. That's the walk. And I saw through all of this in the early days of my ministry, way back in 1941, that our God had a real purpose in life. I didn't understand everything I knew and learned later about the Lord and the usage of that word. But God showing it to me was almost a shocking experience. But I learned as I went along that God's whole point, God's whole reason for forming, making, and creating the original man was that God desired fellowship. And as I look at our people today, it's still the greatness of that truth that lives within my soul. Every father, every father, the only reason you would ever want children, if you sat down and honestly thought about it, and if you really love God, the only reason you would ever want children would be that they could fellowship. It's the only reason. I just want to hug those twins all the time. They usually cry at me, but I like them anyway. See? And I just love them because they're here and they're part of the Weirwell family and it's fellowship. Fellowship. That's the whole reason for God's family, people. It's the whole reason for a believer's family is to have children so that you have what? Fellowship. God waited thousands of years because Adam and Eve screwed it royally. They blew it. God waited until one day there was a woman who really believed and she brought forth God's only begotten son, Jesus Christ, born of a woman. Mary was her name. You know that. This was God's only begotten Son. It was God's reason for fellowship. And if you work the word carefully, you can see the greatness of that fellowship that the Son had with his Father. At the time of the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist in the Jordan, the voice from heaven, which was God speaking, said, This is my beloved what? That's fellowship. In whom I'm well pleased. Jesus Christ came along in his ministry when the religious gang were booing him and yakking at him. And he said, Look, I and my Father are one. That is fellowship. When my son... Don, John, Paul, my son, when they walk with me, love me, share their hearts and lives with me, and we move forth in the greatness of God's word, we are one. What a fellowship. <laughs> At another time, Jesus Christ said, I always do my father's what? That's fellowship. That's the whole purpose. I noticed in 1 John chapter 3, the epistle of 1 John, 
I noticed in chapter 3, the first verse, Behold, behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. And I got to thinking of how much he bestowed upon his only begotten Son. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Then he said, hear him. Then he said, whoever hears him has heard me. Then here in 1 John I read, Behold what manner of the love the Father hath bestowed upon what? Bestowed upon us. That we, just think of it, that we should be called the sons of us that we should be called the sons, small s, of God. Jesus Christ was the S-O-N, capital S-O-N, of God. You and I are S-O-N, small, lowercase s, of God. Man, that puts us in a very high category, though. Jesus Christ was God's only begotten because he is the one whom he formed, made, and created again. You and I are product of our earthly parents, daddies and mommies, while Jesus Christ was only the the product of Mary physically, but he was conceived by God. That made God his daddy. Therefore, it says, the world knoweth us not because it didn't know him. But look at verse 2. He says, Beloved, Now are we, what? Now, 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 right now. We are the sons of God. If Jesus Christ was God's only begotten son so that God could again initiate and have fellowship, what about us? Beloved, now are we the sons of what? God, right now. Yet with all of that, it doth not appear what we shall be, but we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that when he, Jesus Christ, shall appear, return, we shall be like him, for we shall see him, what? As he is. And I thought when I read that, wow! Wham, bang, hit me in the head. That's right. That's fellowship. That's fellowship. That's it. It's fellowship. That's why when I saw this fellowship, then I said, no wonder the word backsliding doesn't appear in the New Testament. Beloved, now are we the sons of God? The word backsliding doesn't appear in the New Testament. It hit me like a ton of bricks because I was always backsliding. Doc Higgins used to say, most Christians are so condemned that God's run out of, even if he was a condemning God, he's already run out of condemnation centuries ago. This thing hit me like a ton of bricks. We are sons of God. Not once does the New Testament talk about a son of God backsliding. But I was taught that I was always backsliding. And that I could slide so far back that I'd no longer be a son. But boy, when I read this and I believed what I read and started working it and thinking it through, beloved, now are we the sons of God? Then I gained an understanding why the word backslide is never used in the New Testament. Because... It can only be used with men and women who are servants. The word backslide can never be used with sons. A servant in your household can slide so far out of your good grace that you boot them, get rid of them. But if you've got a son that you fathered, he can never backslide because if he's the meanest dude in town, he's still your what? Son. (laughs) <laughs> That's right. Wham! Wow! What a revelation! 
from God's Word. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And as sons of God, it's our fellowship with Him. Fellowship is really love. You can't really love until you know who your father is. Wait till those little twins get a little older. They'll find out who their father is. Then they find out who grandpa is. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I can buy them a duck they can play with in their bathtub or something, you know. <laughs> you can't really love someone until you know who your daddy is, who your father is. And when you find that out, then you'll find out who you really are, that you are their son or their daughter. And that is the relationship. That's your standing in that family, people. And then you can begin to love because you know your standing. You know your relationship. Beloved, now are we what? Sons of God. Sons of God. So if I'm born again of God's Spirit, I'm a son of who? That's my relationship. In my first birth, I was the son of Mr. and Mrs. Ernst Werewill. That's my relationship. That was my standing in the Werewill family. So I could love my wonderful father and mother, my brothers and sisters, because they were in the same household, in the same family, same daddy, same mommy. That was my relationship. My standing in the Werewill family was one of a son. Now I'm born again of God's Spirit. Beloved, now I'm a son of whom? So my relationship to God is as one of a what? Son. That's my standing. And as a son, I can lo love him. I can walk with him. And he will walk with me. Hand in hand, we can walk. I did it with my earthly father. I did it with my mother. Did it with my brothers and my sisters in our earthly family. Is our heavenly father people not as good or even better than our earthly family? Don't answer. <laughs> yeah. Real great. You look at this chapter here in John. Again, chapter 1. You know, in all of my years in the theological work, and especially at the University of Chicago Divinity School, they finally talked me out of all that stuff of really looking at the Word. My father and mother didn't know a great accuracy of God's Word, but at least they read it. At the University of Chicago Divinity School, they proclaimed that they knew a lot about the Bible, but they always tore it to pieces. We did a course in hymns. H-Y-M-S. The girls did the other kind. And they took us through and showed us all these emotional hymns and why they appeared in Sunday school songbooks for little kids. But that no adult would ever sing them. And they would take us to the great so-called church hymns that were all written in the minor key and all that other stuff and say, that's the great stuff. And I always remember one they took a crack at that I love so much today and you sing it so often because I love it so much. They said, you know, you had to be a little child in Sunday school, not with any understanding. It had really nothing to say. And that's that one, I come to the garden alone. While the dew is still on the what? 
and then I forget it. I can sing it and can't even remember it. What's the rest of it? And the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses. Then the great chorus. And he walks with me and he talks with me. And he tells me I am his own. Now where are we? And the voice that I hear on my ear. Yeah. Boy, they said, walks with me and talks with me. No, no. That's kid stuff. Baby stuff. You know. And I believe that until after I was in the ministry already. And I began working the word. And the more I worked the word, the more I saw fellowship. I saw God walking with his son, Jesus Christ, talking to him. Then I saw, beloved, now are we the sons of God. And I began to again appreciate. And he walks with me and he talks with me. And he tells me I am his own. Man, oh man. That's why that great song today may be for little kids. But we are children of God, so I'll take it any time. And I get blessed. And if our Heavenly Father today did not walk with me and talk with me daily, I would not believe that I'd be qualified to lead the ministry for which God has given me this fantastic, almost unbelievable responsibility. But you, same God, same Christ, honey. Same Spirit of God in you. He walks with you and he talks with you. We're just finishing two of the greatest advanced classes this week. One in Indiana and the other one in Emporia. I guess almost 1,100, 1,200 people in those two classes. Exciting times. Teaching people again how to hear God speak. See, nobody taught me this in the seminaries and all that stuff because God don't talk to you. Rationalize all that stuff out. Reason gives you the truth of God. Blow nay. Reason never gives you any truth of God. Revelation, people. Revelation. The Word. The Word is revelation. That's where you get the Word of God is the one. If you want to know God's will, go to the Word. Boy, oh boy. That's right. And then in 1 John chapter 1, look at verse 3. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that you also may have what? Fellowship. Fellowship is walking with him, people. Fellowship with us. With us who are walking in the light as he is the light. Fellowship with us who speak the same things. No division. Fellowship. For truly, our fellowship is with whom? The Father. And with his Son, Jesus Christ. That's where our fellowship is. Our relationship is as a son. Our standing with him as a son. Our fellowship is our walk. Walking with him is fellowship. Always doing the Father's will. I and the Father are one. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. That's the walk, sir. The walk. The walk. Verse 4 says, And these things write we unto you that your joy may be what? The reason most people have such little joy is because they're out of fellowship. Born again. Because they believe God raised him from the dead. But not walking the word. Like I said, they didn't know the word. Word hadn't been taught. You can't do the Word of God without knowing it. Oh, you can hit and miss once in a while on it. But to really do God's Word, you have to understand it. You have to read it. You have to know it. These things we write that your joy may be what? You'll have fullness of joy to the end that you're in fellowship. That your joy may be what? So if you want full joy, stay in what? That's the answer. That's the joy in living is in fellowship. (laughs) My goodness. 
And when you're out of fellowship, you're empty. Your joy will not be full. Your joy will be empty because you're out of fellowship. Look at verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is what? Light. God is light and in him, in God, there is no what? Is that what it says? That's what it means. God is light. And again, the last few days, how thankful to God I am when I learned that the author of death is the devil and not the God who created the heavens and the earth as I was originally taught. When I learned that the adversary, the devil, is the one who kills, the one who destroys. Jesus Christ came that we might have life and have it how? But the thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to what? And death is of the adversary, the devil. That's why it so stings. I said to someone last night, I wish the Lord returned real quick and beat the hell out of the devil. See? Or burn him in it or do something. Because there's a day coming with the return of Christ where there'll be no more death, no more sickness, no more suffering. And about all we ever see upon this earth, except for those few moments of greatness when the believers are in twig or in fellowship like this, all we see is suffering, fear, worry, anxiety, and death. But there's a day coming when he'll return as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And there'll be no more death. And what a day that will be. That's the hope of the return. That's what I'm living for. That's what I'm believing toward. God is what? Light and him know what? So to the end that we're in fellowship with him, we'll be in the light. And wherever we're out of fellowship, we'll be living in darkness. My goodness. Then look at chapter 2. Look at verse 3. And hereby we do know, we do know that we what? Know him if we keep his what? Commandments. And to keep his commandments is to get born and live in love, in fellowship with him, because you're part of the household. You, you know your daddy, your father. You know who he is. You can love him. You can love him. That's how we know. Look at verse 5. But whoso keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God, what? Perfected. The love of God is perfected in our walk. That's walking with him. No, hereby know we that we are where? In him, because we are walking in love. Look at verse 6. He that saith, he abideth in what? In him. Ought himself also so to walk, even as he Jesus Christ, what? To walk as he walked is the walk in him. It is to walk in fellowship as he is in fellowship. I and the Father are what? Whenever you do the will of God, he is saying to you again, this is my beloved son. Whenever you are walking on the word of God, you are walking just as perfectly as Jesus Christ walked, honey, because same God, same word. Ought so himself, all, ought himself also so to walk, even as he, Jesus Christ, what? The works that I do, ye shall do also, Jesus said. Look at verse 6 of chapter 1. If we say that we have what? Fellowship with him, but we walk in what? Darkness. We lie and do not the truth. Because to say you're in fellowship but you're walking in darkness is to be broken fellowship. That's broken fellowship. Wherever we break fellowship, ma'am, it's darkness. Wherever we walk in the light as he is the light, it's just an 
effulgence of beautiful, radiant glory. Walk in darkness, we lie and do what? Nothing. But, verse 7, in contrast, if we walk in the light, if we walk in the light, as He, Jesus Christ, is the what? Light. We have what? Fellowship one with what? Another. We have fellowship one with another. He and I walk hand in hand. If I walk in the light as Jesus Christ is the light, he and I have what? Fellowship. Sonship is my relationship with God. It's my standing in the family. My walk keeps me in that household. As I walk with him, hand in hand, he and I, Jesus Christ, have fellowship. It is Christ in you, the hope of what? He walks with you and he talks with you. We go hand in hand. That's fellowship. One with what? Another. And to the end that you walk with your hand in the hand of Christ, I walk with my hand in the hand of Christ. And we have the renewed mind putting on the mind of Christ. There will be no division. We will esteem one another then. We have made him Lord, according to 1 Corinthians. Look at the last part of this great verse 7. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin, all broken fellowship. God knows man's frailty. He knows we are like the grass of the field, the flowers of the field. He knows us. And therefore, he did such a wonderful thing as to institute through Jesus Christ the wonderful cleansing us from all broken fellowship. And he does this by verse 9. If we confess our sins, our broken fellowship, Not sonship. Sonship is relationship. That's standing. Fellowship is our walk with him. If we confess our broken fellowship, he, Jesus Christ, is faithful. He is faithful because he is our intercessor. Jesus Christ, is the one who stands between God and man as our Redeemer, our Sanctifier, all of that. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, all broken fellowship. If you break fellowship, the way to get back in alignment and harmony is to confess that broken fellowship. And his son, Jesus Christ, who intercedes from us, will cleanse us of all that broken fellowship. Then once again, you're in alignment and harmony with him. And you can walk with him and you can talk with him. And you can be a wonderful believer being fulfilled in your life. For you're not living under condemnation. You are living in the light of the salvation of your Redeemer. We have an advocate a barrister, an attorney who intercedes for us. (laughs) Look at Romans chapter 3. Verse 22. Even the righteousness of what? God, which is by dia, through the believing or the faith of Jesus Christ unto all unto all, without exception, and upon all them who do one thing, what? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no difference. 4, verse 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of what? Being, however, here it is, being justified freely. He didn't owe it to us. 
He did it by grace. Didn't have it coming. He did it freely. In His grace, through the redemption that is in whom? Christ Jesus. Verse 25. Whom God hath set forth, foreordained to be a propitiation. Propitiation is payment. God accepted the blood of Jesus Christ. He accepted His life. The giving of Himself, He shed His blood. God accepted that as full payment in full for all mankind. That's the word propitiation. Through, again the word dia, by way of the believing in His blood to declare, to declare His righteousness, God's righteousness for the remission, not the forgiveness for the remission. Remission of sins is for the unsaved sinner. Forgiveness of sin is for the saved one. Remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Look at verse 26. To declare, I say, at this time, His, God's righteousness, that He, God, might be just and the justifier of him who believes in what? Jesus. Boy, what a tremendous truth. That's why this record in 1 John that I just read to you out of verse 7, the last part of it, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses from what? See how that fits with Romans? Also that verse 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to what? And to cleanse us, to cleanse, not cover, but cleanse. You know, when you cover something, the stink is still in there. But when you get it washed out with ivory, it's cleansed. You have only the sweet smell of Chanel number no. 7. It's cleansed. Cleansed us from all what? Sin. All unrighteousness. All broken fellowship. Well, my people, look at Ephesians. Ephesians, chapter 2, chapter 2 of Ephesians. For by grace, I'm in verse 8, for by grace are ye what? Saved. Through faith, through believing, and that not of yourselves, it is the what? It's a gift, it's a gift. My first birth was to me a gift. I had nothing to do with my first coming. My second birth is a gift. Not of any works of mine. It's a gift. God so loved that he what? It's a gift. Not of works, verse 9. Lest any man should what? Then look at verse 10. For we are his. God's workmanship created. Created means to bring into existence that which never been before. We were body and soul. But when we confessed with our mouth, God created something by Christ Jesus in us. Unto good what? That's the fellowship. To walk in the light as he is the light. To worship Him in spirit and in truth. God's whole reason for the creation of His Son in you is that God can have fellowship with you and you with Him. He craves, He desires fellowship. Just like a wonderful earthly father craves and desires fellowship with his sons and daughters. We are God's workmanship. The first time I was born, I was the workmanship of my daddy and mommy. When I'm born again, I'm the workmanship of who? God, people. Most of us discovered that our daddy and mommies loved us enough to pants us and try to do some things for us. We are their workmanship. Well, when I'm born again, I'm the workmanship of God. Does God love us? 
My, how devilish it has been that through the years we have been taught that God is some tyrant, somebody that sits someplace and beats you every time you have a negative thought. That if you commit a sin or you have a fault someplace, God will take it out on you. He'll give you an automobile accident. He'll break your leg. He'll make you sick. Man, that devilish teaching is straight from the pit of hell. For God is a God of light. In him there is no one. And we are God's workmanship. My earthly daddy and mother didn't believe for me to come crippled. They did not believe that I would, you know, have my fingers on the top of my head, my toes sticking out of the side to be a freak. How much more God must love those whom he's called and fathered with all the perfection of the relationship and standing of the righteousness of God as a son before him. We are God's workmanship people, which God has before ordained, knowing us before the foundations of the world, that we should walk in that fellowship, in that perfection. We are God's workmanship, and we're to do what? Walk. That we should what? Walk, walk, walk. Walk in Him. That once again, the world may see sons of God with power walking in the light as He is the light, just holding forth the greatness of God's Word. We were born to live the first time, but we are born again to serve. And the serving is to first of all worship Him and walk in love and fellowship with Him then all the rest will be added to us. That's the walking in him. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the privilege of sharing your word with your people tonight. And may we so walk in this life that our lives will be an adornment of your divine presence and power. Surely love you and thank you, Father, for all the greatness that you've wrought in our hearts and for the beauty of the men and women who have stood with us through the years and simply endeavored to believe your word and grow more perfectly in that love and power of it every day. Thank you in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.